Okay, I think we're set. So thank you everyone in the room and all of you joining us via live stream. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. I'm Tammy Dickinson. I'm the Principal Assistant Director for the Environment and Energy at the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House. And I'm going to open today's session by giving a little bit of background on how and why this session came to be, and I hope that that will help make the uh, discussion later in the session as fruitful as possible. But I want to start by acknowledging that our session today conflicts with the longstanding, the annual uh, NASA Earth Science uh, Town Hall that's happening just down the hall. Uh, and as you know, when you have this many concurrent sessions, there's always going to be a conflict, and this one we unfortunately couldn't avoid. But NASA and AGU were able to work out an arrangement, and we will have a live redo of that town hall tomorrow, same time, same place. That is Moscone West 208 at 12.30, so I hope all of you will be able to attend that session. So this session is going to look at a particular category of space innovation, taking advantage of certain sites to gather data about the Earth. And it, there are many innovative approaches that one can use to observe the Earth. For example, you could have commercial providers of data uh, there are new concepts for small sats and cube sats, and the Obama administration is moving forward on many of those fronts. But today we're going to focus on non-traditional vantage points for Earth observations. As many of you in the room know, in February of 2015, NASA, NOAA, and the U.S. Air Force successfully launched the Deep Space Climate Observatory, or DISCOVER. And in June of this year, DISCOVER reached its orbit point, one million miles from Earth, or at the Lagrange point one. Points like L1 are points in space in which a satellite can maintain a fixed position relative to the Earth. And that makes them great vantage points for studying the Earth for satellites like DISCOVER. L1 presents great opportunities, but it also presents great challenges. And uh, of course, if you were going to put things at L1, you would do it in conjunction with NASA's current constellation of satellites in low Earth orbit and geosynchronous orbit. DISCOVER is equipped with instruments that support a number of Earth science applications. And just two days ago, NASA at AGU held a press conference uh, where they talked about details of the first images that DISCOVER has obtained and are providing new insights into Earth properties like aerosols, cloud cover, and energy balance. Instruments on DISCOVER will also maintain the nation's ability to provide timely alerts and warnings for space weather. Solar storms could disrupt our telecommunications systems, our electric power grids, and our GPS capabilities, as well as other vital systems. And observations from DISCOVER have enabled the first ever near real-time stream of full images of the Earth. These so-called blue marbles are already received an enormous amount of attention, and President Obama has in fact tweeted them on several occasions. These images have helped inspire millions of people around the world to care about the planet Earth and what must be done to better understand and protect it. So that was the motivation for today's session. The DISCOVER mission is one example of how we can advance Earth science and Earth observations from non-traditional vantage points. But who better to come up with other innovative ways uh, to build on this example than the 24,000 plus experts at the fall AGU meeting. So I thank AGU for making this session possible. I and everyone else involved in this, putting the session together are looking forward to hearing your ideas both during the session and after the session. We've got a great panel assembled here, and since we are short on time, I'm going to introduce the entire panel at once. Um, I'll introduce them briefly. Uh, the first panelist is Adam Zabo, chief of the NASA Heliophysics Division Laboratory at the Goddard Space Flight Center, and the NASA project scientist for the DISCOVER mission. And he's going to talk to us about some of the early results from DISCOVER. Second is Thomas Emmel, physicist and senior fellow at UC Berkeley Space Science Laboratory followed by Stuart Brand, president of the Long Now Foundation, and Stacy Bolin, senior systems engineer at NASA Jet Propulsion Lab, and a member of the steering committee for the National Academy's Earth Science Decadal Survey. Each of the panelists will share their insights on advancing Earth observations from non-traditional vantage points, and then I will open it up for some comments and observations from the audience. But before I turn it over to the panel, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. He's a longtime champion of Earth science. He's a He's the former Vice President Al Gore as Chairman of Generation Investment Management. He's the subject of an Oscar award-winning documentary, a co-recipient of a Nobel Peace Prize, and the author of five best-selling books. He devotes the majority of his time to the Climate Reality Project, which is one of the world's leading uh, activities for solutions to climate change. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the former Vice President of the United States, Al Gore. 
Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is such a, a pleasure and honor uh, to be here. This is the third time I've had the privilege of coming to the AGU, and I want to say just a few words about the AGU in a moment, but I want to thank uh, Dr. Tammy Dickinson uh, from the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House for being uh, so wonderful to work with, and uh, the Obama White House has been really a great champion for earth science, and, uh, and uh, Tammy has been wonderful to work with, and we spent a lot of time, several of us uh, who are here, spent a lot of time down at Cape Canaveral when the launch of Discover was postponed uh, several times, and I got to know the, uh, the, the Cocoa Beach Hilton real well, and uh, <laughs> it was really a great experience. And I learned a lot from these scientists uh, around the buffet table and at the bar and uh, when we were killing time waiting, them, waiting for the rocket to go off. Uh, Dr. Adam Sabo is in that category, chief of heliospheric, the heliospheric uh, physics lab at uh, NASA. He'll give you a great presentation. Also, Dr. Thomas Immel at the Space Sciences Lab uh, at nearby Berkeley. My longtime friend, uh, Stuart Brand from the Long Now Foundation, uh, he's, uh, uh, he's sui generis. I don't know how I can, uh, but I remember giving the uh, whole Earth Catalog to so many people. And Dr. Stacy Boland uh, from the NAS uh, Standing Committee on Earth Sciences and Applications. I also want to acknowledge Chris Rapley, who is here from the UK. He was head of the British Antarctic uh, Survey and is now at Oxford. And um, he's also uh, somebody I've had a chance to work with quite a bit. I'm going to show a few pictures. I know that'll shock uh, people here. Uh, but uh, I want to begin by saying a word about the uh, IPCC. Uh, I just came from Paris. I spent uh, the entire time there from the day before it began uh, to the day after it ended. And it was... Uh, a great success, in my opinion, uh, if you compare the outcome to the range of potential outcomes expected beforehand, it was right at the top of the range and maybe a little bit above. That has to be seen in uh, connection with the fact that a, personal, a, a perfectly rational species would go to DEFCON 5 and start doing all kinds of emergency measures to save the stability of the Earth climate that's uh, fostered the flourishing of human civilization. We are in the danger zone. The good news is that there's a much broader understanding of that fact. Uh, and the good news is that 195 nations all agreed on a plan of action that, while far from ideal, nevertheless sets in motion a process of change that gives us an excellent chance of accelerating the measures that could actually bring us uh, to a point where we can start stabilizing the climate. Uh, the, the, the late economist Rudy Dornbush once said, things take longer to happen than you think they will, and then they happen faster than you ever thought they could. And certainly the arrival of a, of a proto-consensus in the world community on the need to take dramatic action to decarbonize the global economy has taken longer <laughs> than anybody thought it would. Now, I hope the second part of uh, Rudy Dornbush's aphorism kicks in pretty soon. But the five-year so-called review and ratchet provisions in this treaty and the long-term goal of decarbonizing the global economy in the second half of the century, they, the wording is slightly different, but that's the essence of it will take place um, against the backdrop of uh, a continuing dramatic cost reduction curve in uh, solar photovoltaic energy, wind energy, uh, energy storage uh, efficiency, and it's a continuing dramatic cost reduction curve in uh, solar photovoltaic energy, wind energy, uh, energy storage uh, efficiency and its innumerable manifestations. And against the backdrop of the build-out of the Internet of Things and the 
the, uh, the, the global mind or the digital universe that will give us much more uh, transparent views uh, into every aspect of the global economy and all the national plans. And one of the binding provisions of this agreement, it's not all unbinding, one of the binding provisions requires uh, full transparency in these reviews. And so all these national plans will be visible and all the components of the plans will be accessible over the Internet. And civil society, which is now freshly uh, awakened and active on this uh, crisis, I think can play a big role. And the, the signal sent to the business community and the investor community along with civil society is very, very powerful. And we're already getting feedback that uh, the message is being received very powerfully. But I wanted to make this point before I began, Tammy, by expressing my thanks to a group that wasn't really singled out in all of the celebrating in Paris, and I want to single out the IPCC, because there is absolutely no way that the world community could ever have even dreamed of developing this consensus without the incredible, tireless, volunteer multi-year effort by the thousands of scientists who make up the IPCC. And since this uh, AGU gathering each year is the single largest uh, gathering for members of the IPCC anywhere on the planet, I would like to begin my talk by saying thank you, IPCC, and I would like to ask all of you, even those of you who are members of the IPCC, to join in giving a round of applause to the IPCC for what they've done. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to show you some pictures uh, uh, to accompany my uh, presentation. This, of course, will come as no surprise to anybody. This uh, Earthrise image taken on um, December 24th, uh, 1968, was uh, credited with awakening the modern version of the environmental movement. Within 18 months of this image being seen here on Earth, the first Earth Day was organized. The Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, and its counterparts in many other countries came in the immediate aftermath of the consciousness raising that accompanied this picture. Some of you have seen the NASA recreation of the soundtrack from the space capsule. I mean, this, capsule, this uh, craft didn't land on the moon, of course. They were the first to go around the moon, and they were looking for landing sites. And um, uh, they, their attention was focused on the surface of the moon. Uh, and one of them just happened to look up and see this through the window and said, wow! And what unfolded next was uh, like a scene from a movie about a family on vacation where somebody says, where's my camera? Get my camera. Do you have some color film? And they were fishing around fine and they lost the image and then it came in view in another window. Uh, and then the image was taken and it, it really caused a dramatic change. This was actually not the first Earthrise picture. When I got into this, I began to collect these images, but this is actually the first Earthrise picture, which was taken two years earlier by, the Lo by Lunar Orbiter 1, an unmanned spacecraft, 1966. And of course, it did not have the impact in any way, shape, or form, partly because of the nature of the image and it wasn't seen by very many people. But you'll hear more about uh, consciousness raising in 1966 from Stewart here in a minute. Uh, so then, on the last of the Apollo missions, this is the most published photograph in all of human history, the Blue Marble. Uh, and the, the Blue Marble uh, was taken uh, on December 7, 1972, on the Apollo 17 mission, the last mission. It was the only image, I'm given to believe, that was taken when, uh, during the Apollo missions when the spacecraft uh, was between the Earth and the Moon with the Sun directly behind the spacecraft. 
And so it has the uh, magical quality of presenting the fully illuminated disk of the Earth. And that picture uh, is the single most powerful iconic picture uh, in uh, the uh, collection of images that make up uh, uh, in all of the pictures available in human civilization. I put that picture courtesy of NASA in a large format uh, on my wall in the West Wing when I moved into the White House as Vice President. And after about six years, I had uh, memorized every jot and tittle of it, and I called up uh, NASA and uh, said, I'm ready for another one. And uh, that's <laughs> Dan Golden, my buddy, was heading NASA then. And that's, that's when I learned that there wasn't another one. And, and I learned the story of why there wasn't another one. And I began uh, to try to imagine how we could get another one. And I won't give you the whole long history of uh, the Discover project, but suffice it to say that uh, there was quite a battle to get it approved. One of the uh, uh, leaders of the other party in the Congress during those days uh, said, uh, it's a waste of money. It'll be like watching your grass grow. And I asked my staff to get me the annual budget Americans spend on lawn care. And uh, turns out it's $35 billion a year. And I said, well, people like to watch their grass grow. It was a bit more involved and complicated than that. But the National Academy of Sciences gave it its uh, uh, highest uh, recommendation. And of course, uh, the scientists, uh, these, many of these same scientists who are here, uh, and uh, some who are, are not here, I'd like to single out Dr. Francisco Valero, who is now uh, down in La Jolla. I, I, I had hoped he could come here today. He's retired, but he led the uh, first science team, and many of these folks worked with him. He's a great, great man. And he and his colleagues and these folks put together a suite of scientific instruments that are just absolutely incredible. Anyway, uh, then... It, uh, the launch date was set, and then it got uh, <laughs> canceled. I'm not going to go into the, all of the reasons why. A few of you know the story. Uh, but the good news is that when President Obama was elected, I went in and had the privilege of talking with him about it, and he, uh, he, he allocated the money uh, to launch it. Uh, and it wasn't the only image of the Earth. This, of course, is from the departing Galileo taken on December 11th, 1990, the first home movie of the planet. You can see the sun reflected off the Earth. This is really a beautiful little movie. I'm going to play it again. Uh, you, you can see Africa and Australia ends up around South America. I love that image also. Uh, and then um, 15 years after that, this is Messenger coming by the Earth on its uh, slingshot orbit to get out to Mercury, and we recently got the images taken by Messenger of, of Mercury. Uh, then, of course, uh, the famous Voyager 1 photo from uh, February 14, 1990, 4 billion miles from the Earth, known as the pale blue dot, and the late Carl Sagan suggested uh, the capture of this image and came up with the poetic uh, words, there we are, pale blue dot suspended in a sunbeam. Uh, and uh, this is its own inspiring image. Cassini gave us an inspiring image. Uh, July 19th, 2013. That's the Earth in the lower right-hand quadrant under the rings of Saturn. And the last one of these images I'm going to show is hard to see, but it's from the Mars rover, the Curiosity rover. You can barely see the Earth from the surface of Mars in the upper right. Hard to see it from the stage. Thank you for dimming the lights. You can see it up in the uh, right-hand side of the upper quadrant. Is it the right-hand side? Let's see. No, left-hand side. Left-hand side, do you see it? Yeah, there you go. I was at, we've got JPL represented here. I was at JPL watching that thing bounce off the surface of them or watching the representation. Oh, gosh, that was exciting when that mission uh, took place. All right, um, 
There are so many other images of the Earth from space that are meaningful to me. This is one from the space station that illustrates the perhaps the single most uh, important misconception by lay people about the atmosphere. When you stand outside and look up at the sky, it looks like a vast and limitless expanse, but as these images uh, confirm what scientists have long known, it's a very thin space. And when we put 110 million tons of global warming pollution into it every day, as if it's an open sewer, uh, it adds up. And uh, Jim Hansen, uh, who's been a go-to scientist for so many of us, points out that the accumulated global warming pollution, man-made global warming pollution, now traps as much heat energy every day as it would be released by 400,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs going off every 24 hours. So um, this is the typical satellite view before Discover. And these uh, kinds of image streams have been uh, patched together. Uh, my friend Tom Van Sant uh, in um, Santa Monica put together these iconic images of cloud-free views of the entire Earth service that are now used by virtually every a television newscaster in in the world. Uh, oops, what happened there? I didn't know these remotes had that capability. Uh, I'll just spin the globe here and end up on Tom's uh, iconic flat screen projection, which again is used so uh, typically now. So the Discover, as everybody here knows, uh, gives us the unique vantage point available from uh, the Sun-Earth Lagrangian 1 point, uh, 1.5 uh, million kilometers from the Earth, 150 million kilometers from the Sun, co-orbiting the Sun with the Earth so that uh, it always has a sunlit view of the full disk of the Earth. We waited a long time for it to be launched, but when we were down in Cape Canaveral... T minus 10, 9... Eight, on February seven, 11th, six, five, it was a great four, thrill. three, two, one, zero, and liftoff. The Falcon takes flight, propelling the Deep Space Climate Observatory on a million mile journey to protect our planet Earth. The Falcon 9 did such a good and precise job that. Uh, Virtually all the fuel on the spacecraft is now available to keep it on station in a Lissajou orbit around the L1 point, extending its lifetime, uh, provided some other uh, things don't accidentally cut short its lifetime. And this is the first image NASA released from uh, the L1 point from Discover. Beautiful uh, image. Here is a, another. Uh, here is uh, the famous uh, moon photobombs Earth. It looks like it's uh, it looks like it's photoshopped, uh, but it's not. And they've actually learned uh, something about the moon from that image that they didn't know before. I'll let them answer questions about that if you have them. Here's the latest. Uh, this is this latest one is Earth photobombs moon. <laughs> Pretty cool. <laughs> now. Um, this is uh, from just uh, three days ago, where, you know, they can simulate uh, from the 14 images per day the rotation of the Earth, which is a very cool thing uh, to watch. But my own uh, personal favorite image uh, is the one I want to show you next. Here is the blue marble. Because this played such a, an inspirational role for me in my thinking about the whole climate crisis, I was actually waiting for December 7th this year when the when Antarctica was tilted at the same angle uh, and the uh, aspect of Africa in the image was the same as the blue marble. I've been waiting for this. <laughs> it was a little bit off on December 7th, so I picked the December 8th image, uh, and here it is. Blue marble, blue marble two, <laughs> or whatever people want to call it. Uh, but they have learned so much, it is actually thrilling. I am in no way qualified to tell you 
what they have learned, but I'll close with this, repeating what the low Earth orbiters uh, give us and contrasting it with what Discover gives us. And with all of the instruments, with all of the many wavelengths that they can uh, use to observe the Earth, the science they're doing from the L1 point is absolutely phenomenal. And I want to close. I began by expressing my thanks to the IPCC. I would like to close by expressing my deepest respect and most profound thanks to the scientists who have been part of the, the team to exploit uh, the potential for observing at the L1 point. It can serve and will serve as a common calibration point, a common candle, as they say, uh, to improve the accuracy of all of the other satellites by having them calibrating a, a calibrated against a common uh, information uh, stream uh, and collecting all of the data into a consistent and congruent whole. But there have been a lot of exciting surprises as they exploit the L1 point. But Tammy, thank you for uh, organizing this panel. Uh, thanks to the AGU for inviting me back, and thanks to everybody that's made this possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, for those uh, insightful remarks, and I'm sure that they have stimulated some food for thought for our panel discussion. Um, so we're going to move right into the panel, and Adam, you're up first. Good afternoon. We are, of course, just as excited, possibly even more than uh, Mr. Gore, looking at the images, uh, working with this uh, mission for uh, over 15 years. It is really gratifying to see beautiful images coming from a mission that sets for so long on the ground. It's a much better vantage point than at the storage room in uh, Goddard Space Flight <laughs> Center. <laughs> the images are great, but of course we are also very excited to do science with it. We are still in the process of doing the absolute calibrations of the 10 wavelength channels of the EPIC instruments, but we have already started to see some inklings of the importance, what new things can we do from this unique vantage point of one and a half million miles away. My son asked me that, uh, Dad, I always thought that if you want to take a good picture of something, you get close to it. Why is it that you went far away from it to take a, a good picture? Uh, very good question. Uh, the advantages that we have uh, counted on is that from the L1 vantage point, you see the full sunlit face of Earth, as Mr. Gore pointed out, all at once. I see the morning, I, uh, the sunrise, I see the sunset, and everything in between. By taking pictures at least once every two hours, we see the diurnal, the daily variation of cloud covers, uh, the uh, aerosols, anything that changes on the surface. It doesn't take a whole day to accumulate these images. We went through the early results on Monday morning, as Tammy was pointing out. I will only show you, okay, that's not quite my, here we go. Uh, I will only show you two quick results to, to remind you the type of thing that we can do. These are a aerosol observations by taking two UV channels and combining them. Uh, we see here uh, dust in the atmosphere over the Sahara Desert. We, we are not seeing the dust on the ground. This is dust in the air, and in fact, in multiple images, we see this dust uh, flowing across the Atlantic through the Caribbean basin. Again, see the whole disk all at once. That we, we are showing this because it's relatively easy to generate compared to the other data products that are coming later on. Uh, again, this is just a, a taste of the type of science that we will be doing. Uh, we also have a radiometer on board, the NISTAR uh, instrument, that measures the Earth only with a single pixel. Now, 
okay, before you wonder that we have a 2K by 2K camera, uh, 4 million pixels, why on earth do I fly a single pixel camera on top of it? I keep telling people, but this pixel is really, really good. I mean, uh, <laughs> it's really, really accurate. Uh, its whole point is to measure the reflected and radiated light from uh, Earth very accurately. Now, uh, what you are seeing on the left side, uh, those curves, that's the NISTAR data. You are seeing four days of continuous observation. Uh, so you can see the wiggles going up and down. Those are uh, the four days. Of course, the scene of Earth is changing as the Earth rotates around. So good thing, we see the Earth is spinning. That's a good first uh, result. <laughs> Wouldn't quite characterize it as a surprise. Uh, the, the, once we paired it up with the epic images, and notice those thumbnails below the image, each of them pointing to a particular point on the curve. What was very striking to us is that uh, whenever you have Africa, which is in the center thumbnail, in the uh, field of view, we had the most reflected light. This is photodiode observation, so this is primarily reflected light, not radiated light. And it's really, really dominant, much more so than at least I naively expected. On the other hand, on the left side, you have the Pacific Ocean. And of course, it's uh, not reflecting nearly as much. Again, not a surprise. Everybody knew this before, that the ocean is uh, less reflective than, the, than the, uh, the continental surfaces. But the amount of difference is very, very striking. Now move from the left panel to the right panel. Uh, same for type of four days, same type of image. The difference is that we moved in time a uh, little bit over a month. On the right side, we are very close to the winter solstice. Of course, due to the Earth's spin axis being tilted, we see at this time much more uh, the Antarctic, as Mr. Gore was looking for this ta time for his uh, blue marble number two. Uh, this shows, of course, the, uh, the ice sheet from the Antarctic. Notice that the scale on left and right for the wiggles are exactly the same. <clears throat> Notice how much more light is reflected just from the fact that we see the ice sheets. Mm. Now, we also happen to have a little bit more cloud cover, so it's a combination of the two. It really underscores the importance of having ice sheets on the two poles, North and South Pole. It really is a major contributor for our energy budget. So again, these are just two uh, t uh, teasers for you. Uh, please look up the, the press conference where we have lots more uh, material or our web page. Quickly, uh, I was asked that as part of the panel discussion that, so what can we do after discovery? Good, it's up there. Uh, hopefully the next one won't take 15 plus years uh, to get it up there. What more could we possibly do? Now, uh, Part of the problem to first order, the Earth's energy budget is a big number, the sunlight coming in, lots of energy, the Earth reflects and radiates out, big number. We take the difference and we hope that we measured both of these accurately enough that the tiny number left over is accurate. So we need to increase the accuracy. One way we can do that is as time passes by, the instrumentation like NISTAR on Discover that instrument was designed and built in the late 90s. That's a long time in today's technological progress. Today, the same type of instrument could be built an order of magnitude better signal to noise ratio. We could really improve our accuracy. Uh, if we had the same platform, see L1 is beautiful because we can see always the sunlit side of Earth. But if you think in reverse, the other side, you always see the sun having a set of instruments staring back toward the sun so that we have both sides of the equation it appeals to me because now I have both big numbers from the same platform measured hopefully with the same accuracy. So when I take the difference, I have a higher accuracy platform. Uh, next, of course, measuring it once is beautiful. And I am very excited and we will be writing papers and coming to the AGU and, and impressing hopefully people. But, the, the, but 
the climate issue is a long-term issue. We cannot resolve the climate issue with a single time measurement. We need duration. These measure, measurements need to take place over a long period of time so that we can figure out trends. Now, notice uh, that, uh, of course, everybody knows that the reflected light is not the same in all directions. We picked the L1 point because it's a particularly difficult measurement to make, the backscattered light. Uh, Terra and aqua measures at uh, 1030 and 130. We are measuring uh, very close to the sun Earth line, 4 to uh, 15 degrees. Well, how about the rest? It's, uh, the Earth goes all the way around 360. Who is measuring the rest of the directions? So one particular idea that occurred to me is that besides the sun Earth Lagrange point, the Earth has a Lagrange point with the moon too. If we put a satellite in the L4 of the point of the Earth's moon system, which basically follows the moon's orbit, not right in front, not right behind, next to it. So we are going around at 60 Earth radii. We are far enough that we still see, you saw the Apollo images, you still see the full sunlit disk of Earth, but in a month, you basically cover all angles of reflection. You will have backside, you will have side, front, all directions. In the meanwhile, it's slow enough that you have the Earth spinning below it. It will take exactly a month to go around, by the way, in case you wanted to check. And it will take uh, 24 hours, of course, for the Earth to show all its sides. So we will have changing scenery, yet we will explore the different uh, look directions. Of course, we can do the same thing if you have a whole bunch of lower orbit uh, uh, low Earth, low Earth orbit satellite, a constellation, and then you have uh, multiple measurements probably would accomplish uh, the same thing. Uh, final thought. Rather than flying the uh, same EPIC instrument, EPIC is great, it makes beautiful pictures, but it's limited to 10 wavelengths. We were very careful in selecting. Jay Herman spent countless number of uh, sleepless nights to figure out which wavelengths to pick, because we only had 10, not 11, not 12, 10. Uh, and he had to pick it, and we had to live with it forevermore. If we had a spectrometer where you actually measure all the wavelengths, we would be able to do a much richer uh, science. We would be able to get water vapor, uh, sodium dioxide, uh, nitrogen dioxide, and if we are really venturesome and move beyond the silicon capability and go into infrared, we would be able to even get methane and carbon dioxide, again, for the full solid disk of Earth. So spectrometers uh, measurements uh, would be a great advantage. It's also, by the way, measures it all at the same time rather than one separated in time. So. These are just quick ideas uh, to consider. The L1 point is a new vantage point. We are still figuring out what uh, new things we can do. We are still running into surprises that we were not counting on. Uh, so stay tuned. Please come back next to AGU, and we will have a session on it. Thank you very much. Can I, can I insert uh, 30 seconds? I have permission from Tammy to insert 30 seconds. Yeah. When, we're putting to, when you're putting together that suite of instruments for the replacement, you know they can make live color HD TV cameras real small and light now. You don't say. I, I've heard, I've yes, heard. Sir. Wouldn't it be great to have a, a continuous live like color that. TV <laughs> image of the earth yes. all the time? I think that'd be yes. pretty cool. That was supposed to be what. That was supposed to be. I know. That was that was I supposed tried. to be on this one, but uh, anyway, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. So thank you, Adam and Thomas. You're next, and I would uh, note for the speakers that the light down here. Okay. Oh, that's not just for entertainment. No, that was not just for entertainment. Not just for entertainment. <laughs> yeah. Merry Christmas. Um, I'll take three minutes and maybe a tad bit more, but thank you, Adam, uh, for that uh, review. Um, I would like to present a quick vision for uh, another scientific uh, topic that could be addressed from L1. L1 is obviously a great vantage point for a number of science topics, particularly for uh, Earth science, and I think Discover's observations are uh, revolutionary in Earth science. 
Um, coming from the space physics and aeronomy section of AGU, we had our revolution uh, from L1 when we started getting real-time solar wind observations from that vantage point, which I, I think you mentioned. Um, getting that back in 1996, uh, when the, the launch of ACE was one of the most remarkable things that happened in space science ever, and now is just absolutely indispensable for us, and has become a national asset. So it's clear that, uh, that that's an important observation, but there's other things that you can do from L1, and I'd like to point that out. My interests lie in the region of space around Earth that's impacted the magnetosphere and everything inside down to the boundary of space where um, the solar wind energy can be input. In fact, we know now that the lower atmosphere and the Earth science uh, topics start rising up into our ballpark as well. So that's very interesting for us. And I see a real opportunity here uh, with potentially uh, new observations. And the observations, we don't have them, but we do have them for a different planet. And this is Mars and in the ultraviolet from two different vantage points, two different NASA assets uh, that we've collected over the years. And these have been presented very recently in, in conjunction with the MAVEN uh, arrival at Mars and the new papers that came out were introduced here at this at this meeting. The planetary mission showing the outer atmosphere of Mars and the extended atmosphere of hydrogen in both uh, in both of these images. Sorry, on the left, that's a, a Hubble space telescope image showing the extended atmosphere. Now that's atmospheric loss, and the reason why Maven is there to study this the atmosphere is because it's gone, or it's, and it continues to leave. Um, so it shows a um, a capability that exists that we have not instituted for Earth. Um, you brought up, uh, uh, Mr. Gore brought up the uh, Apollo missions and all the views from Earth. There was one time from, from the moon where we, uh, where John, uh, Commander John Young pointed an NRL built at Naval Research Laboratory film camera at the Earth and took an ultraviolet image just like this of the Earth. And that's the last time we were outside of the mm. Earth's atmosphere taking that image. That was Apollo 16. And uh, it's an iconic image as well, and I, I failed to put it up today. I don't know where I, why I brought, didn't bring that, but I've just been thinking about it ever since you mentioned it. So um, it's a capability we'd like to, to see, see done, and um, we can do it now with much better precision and uh, accuracy than was, has ever been done before. Um, uh, you know, space is hard, but uh, UV telescopes are kind of we're pretty good, pretty good at those things. So. We'd love to uh, see uh, pointed back at the Earth as well as pointed towards the sun, uh, some new imaging. I just, just to maybe connect it a little bit more to the Earth science community, um, there's a few things going on. We've we realized very much that this outer atmosphere of Earth is affected by changes in the composition of the lower atmosphere, specifically the carbon uh, introduction of CO2 and methane. And I just walked out of a session before I came over here where we were discussing this specific topic of changes in the upper outer atmosphere of Earth due to uh, different to due to processes that come from uh, the addition of carbon, the upper atmosphere is now known to be coupled much more tightly to the to the lower atmosphere than we realized, and takes a lot of those in, takes a lot of energy from the lower atmosphere. And in fact, today and tomorrow, we're, uh, there are papers and posters describing uh, El, El Nino Southern Oscillation effects in the ionosphere. So it's, it's, it's another uh, uh, look at the Earth that, that we've got now. It's very exciting to see that coming about. And NASA's next heliophysics mission is to study the coupling of the lower atmosphere to the upper atmosphere. So it's very highly topical for us. A, uh, uh, and, and these kinds of missions give us a systems view of the Earth's atmosphere, which we're really developing right now. And we're very pleased to be doing that because it's actually exciting. And it's a geophysics problem. It, it's, uh, you can talk about earth science, planetary, uh, heliophysics, who owns this thing? Well, it's a geophysics problem, and I think it's incumbent upon uh, NASA to, to help us uh, work, find a way forward. Uh, NASA and other agencies maybe have, have collaborated on Discover. So uh, with that, I just want to pass it back and, and thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Tom. Vice President, and Tammy, thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Stuart Brin. Yes. Thank you, Tom. All right, we have sound. Um, I guess I do the advancing. Ha. Uh, 50 years ago, next February, I asked the psychedelic question, why haven't we seen a photograph of the whole Earth yet? And that led two years later in 68 to the whole Earth catalog. Um, I'm going to make the point, the uh, case today, following on a previous speaker for L2. Uh, L2, well, let's see, the sun's about there, so L1 for Discover is right now is up a little bit to the left. 
which puts L2 right down there right now, on the other side of Earth from the sun, about the same distance, a million miles away. It's a familiar spot for the scientists because we're sending uh, the James Webb Telescope there shortly. Uh, but it is going to be making amazing discoveries in the universe and none whatsoever about Earth because it isn't looking at Earth, it's looking out. In fact, it has uh, heavy shielding to prevent anything from Earth uh, polluting the, the signals coming into the James Webb Telescope. So what if we had discovered two at L2? Um, as we know, it could have much better uh, imaging. It could be uh, what Al wants with the, the full-time video of uh, the nighttime side uh, rotating away. And uh, that itself would be interesting. Uh, but you know, we'd see much more than what's in this little animation. We'd be seeing not only the lights of civilization, which are themselves pretty interesting, the radiation of the Earth itself uh, with no sun bounce to deal with, uh, the radiation of civilization in its various forms. Uh, you'd see the amazing uh, lightning uh, that astronauts are always noticing, the light show that goes on with that. You'd see what the clouds do at night. Uh, you'd see the northern lights. This has got to be a pretty uh, high dynamic range set of imaging, but you could do it. Uh, you would see uh, the photobombing of the moon. Uh, it would be coming around and doing you know, full moon, coming across the front sometimes. And so you'd see the, the lunar light coming and going. I think it would be uh, pretty interesting, and, and as been pointed out, uh, it would be providing a related image uh, data compared to what's happening on the sun side. I do want to make an emotional appeal about these damn gifts that we're getting from the <laughs> Epic camera. Uh, they're disturbing to people because of the jagginess. There's lots of software in NASA yeah. that can do the in-betweening so it would move smoothly like the one on the left does. And I think that would be much more comforting. This is sort of disrespectful. And I think the, the whole fundamental point that you, Al, wanted to make here and that humanity is making with this kind of imagery is respect for the planet. Thank you. Well, thank you. So Stacy? Okay. See if I can advance. Okay, we all know budgets are tight. Those of you who follow the National Academy's 2007 Earth Science Decadal Survey and the midterm assessment also know that the number of Earth observations from NOAA and NASA is also declining. Yet there's no shortage of needs. Earth observations are needed for both science and society. They're not only interesting, they're not only beautiful, but they're important. And so now more than ever, we need to think creatively about ways to meet those observation needs. There's no substitute for an adequate budget, but as a community, we're compelled to do the best with what we can muster. And that means we need to be innovative and we need to be opportunistic. If there's a spacecraft or a launch vehicle headed somewhere with extra capability, is there some way that we can leverage that to help meet our Earth observation needs? Non-traditional vantage points, vantage points like L1, L2, the moon, and others are things we need to consider. And so right now, the Earth science community is gearing up for its next decadal survey. And as a member of the steering committee of that decadal survey, I can tell you that we are looking for innovative ideas. We wanna do the best science we can in these challenging fiscal times, and that means everything's on the table. We need to consider non-obvious solutions and open up our playbook, and that means looking at non-traditional vantage points and looking to leverage host spacecraft or catch a ride on a launch vehicle with extra capability. It's not easy, but the benefits can be substantial. These kinds of missions are hard, but in the best kinds of ways. They have challenges, but also opportunities. They require teamwork, out-of-the-box thinking. Sometimes they cross disciplinary boundaries that can make it very hard for these ideas to even be fairly considered. So let's think creatively and then critically about these ideas. When the benefits are there, when the science makes sense, Let's not be afraid to look deeper at them. And so I invite you to follow along the decadal survey process as it continues. There's a link to the website here on the screen beside me. 
And as we start our call for concepts uh, in the future, I encourage you, please share your ideas with us. Thank you, Susan. Okay, thank you, panelists. Now we're going to open it up for a, some questions from the floor, if we have any. Uh, there's a microphone. I cannot see it from my vantage point. There's a microphone somewhere. Ah, got it. Is there a microphone in the stand? It's mobile. Ah, there's a microphone walking around. Sorry, change of plans. So somebody want to raise their hand? Thank you very much for the interesting wonderful town hall meeting. So I am new to the Discover uh, mission, come from a background in, in operational forecasting meteorology. And with a weather radar, whenever the sun happens to get right in the radar's line of sight, you just see noise. Mm -hmm. And just thinking about the geometry of the L1, how do you get data from Discover? Because your antenna will be, have to be pointing right at the sun. How, how do you get around that problem? Adam? Uh, in reality, we are not flying exactly at the L1 point. It's an unstable saddle point. Lassitude orbits have to orbit around it. We are always at least four degrees away. So if you look at Sun, Earth, spacecraft, it's at least four degrees away and sometimes as much as uh, 12, uh, 15 degrees. This is the only stable orbit that uh, we can uh, fly around. The four degree is critical, as you correctly uh, say, the sun admits not just light, radio signals too, and that messes with transmission. So we stay away from the radio noise of the sun. That's how we talk. And it's regularly done for ACE, wind, SOHO. It, it's not the first time we are doing it. Adam says if you go out and look at the sun now, the uh, discovery is about four fingers to the left and two fingers up. Very technical. <laughs> Other questions? Okay. I think the mic went to the back, am I right? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, my name is Barry Rock. I'm a uh, professor emeritus at the University of New Hampshire. And Mr. Vice President, I was your first senior scientist for the GLOBE program. Oh, thank you, sir. And I can see a wonderful follow-on here for our K through 12 education. Mm. Uh, the students can provide some calibration data for the DISCOVER program and also learn a great deal about planet Earth by seeing it from a million miles out. So hopefully someone is thinking of developing a K-12 program. That, that's fantastic. May I speak briefly to yes, that? Yes, sir. Many people here are probably not aware of the GLOBE program, but it is a NASA program. I started it when I was in the Senate uh, and gave it a big boost when I became vice president. Uh, how many thousand schools are involved now around the world? Something like 90 countries? Do you know offhand? About 110. 110,000 schools, is that what you're saying, or 110 countries? 110 countries, a uh, couple of million schools. A couple million schools. Wow. And what happens in these schools is the students learn a little bit about computer science. Some of them do it on pencil and paper. But at the same time every day, they go and make Earth observations around their school. Temperature, wind speed, um, uh, the uh, pH in the in the uh, streams, uh, they'll, some of them do uh, le uh, vegetation uh, surveys, uh, and all of the information collected in these two million schools around the world is collected together, and NASA actually generates uh, an image of the Earth from the data collected by the students. Now, <clears throat> here's a, a really interesting thing they discovered. They can audit the accuracy of this data. It turns out to be very, very accurate, particularly in the aggregate, and it has served as the basis for some very useful scientific uh, work. But it also serves the, the basis of science education in these schools uh, and also uh, computer literacy in many of these schools. I had the, the very uh, gratifying experience as vice president of visiting countries where the number one item on the agenda 
for the, uh, like the, I remember the nation of Benin in Africa, for example. The, the president of Benin, his number one item was his request for his schools to be added to the NASA's GLOBE program. So this thing flies kind of under the radar. I think my DNA was completely scrubbed off it, so it survived the, uh, the, the, a, 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 a previous uh, administration. Uh, but, but NASA has put a lot of time in it. There's a lot of volunteer work. And thank you. I, you know, that, that is great. This uh, could be combined with the GLOBE program, and these kids could uh, really get a lot out of it. All right. Okay, I'm told we have time for one last question. And I see lots of hands over here. Can we get a microphone over here? Far aisle. Where are we? Raise your hands. There we go. Pick one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Uh oh, it's going to be chaos. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tamara Airwood from Could you Side stand Eva. up, please? No? Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I can't stand. Um, thank you for taking my question. Uh, we know that the Department of Defense has satellites uh, that are collecting valuable data and that are soon to be decommissioned. Uh, how can people in academia negotiate with the Department of Defense in order to ensure that new satellites will also be used for science and not just military applications? Thank you. Would you like to respond to that, Mr. Vice President? I, I would like to respond to that. It's a great, it's a great question. Um, <laughs> Good response. <laughs> uh, we should try to do that, and uh, <laughs> and you know Tammy works for John Holdren, who's who's been a tremendous science advisor, and I, I think it would be a good agenda item for OSTP. But but let me give you a little background on this. Um, when I was before I became vice president, when I was in the United States Senate. I was so obsessed with uh, earth science from a lay point of view, trying to get, and the scientific community has been so generous and patient in explaining things over and over and over again, and finally getting into the simple language that I can understand and, and therefore can communicate to others. That's sort of what I do with most of my life. Uh, and I, like you, the thought occurred to me early on when I was on the Intelligence Committee and the Armed Services Committee Good Lord, the amount of data relevant to earth science collected in the black is many, many orders of magnitude larger than the science collected, than the data collected uh, in, in, in the open. Uh, for example, uh, Landsat, it's an old system, a complete picture of the earth's surface every 18 days, less than 0.8 zero one percent of those images have ever fired a single neuron in a single human brain. Uh, they are stored in digital silos. Uh, similarly, the, the data collected by the so-called SOSIS, it's an acronym, of course, the Undersea uh, Microphone Array. There are hundreds of systems in the black that collect valuable data. Uh, one that was particularly compelling to me in the studying the Arctic ice cap, we had overhead images of the area of ice, but the impact of global warming on the Arctic ice cap could not be really assessed accurately without the thickness of the ice. But since 1957, when Captain William Anderson took the Nautilus under the ice cap, the uh, military submarines have been traversing under the ice cap as part of our national security mission. All of their routes are top secret for good, good reasons, but they, since they can only surface in ice that's uh, three feet thick or thinner, they have upward looking instruments that measure the thickness of the ice. Uh, and so uh, I, the um, Admiral of the Navy, of the nuclear Navy at that time, I went up to the Arctic uh, on submarines under the ice cap twice and to the North Pole, which was a thrill, uh, uh, and to see the instruments line up zero, 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 and surface right at the pole. Anyway, they converted those instruments and worked out a protocol to protect the national security component of the data, but to release the data that was relevant to scientists to begin measuring 
ice thickness. That led to a program that's little known called the Medea program that was housed in the bowels of the CIA uh, that cleared a hundred Earth scientists with top secret clearances to go in and, and retrieve all of this data that was top secret, again, scrubbed carefully pr to protect the national security interests uh, involved. It literally revolutionized many fields. Uh, uh, marine mammals, for example, they, when they first got access to that, under, uh, that uh, undersea microphone array, uh, they were down with the uh, Navy corpsman operating the microphones and they heard this sound, I can't re reproduce it, but they were calling it a, a snapping shrimp. And the, the scientists there said, uh, and no, he gave them the wavelength and everything. That's a blue whale. Uh, in one hour, they collected more observational data on blue whales than in the entire previous published scientific literature. And there are many other fields where that ratio of information in the black to information in the open holds true. Now, um, a woman named Linda Zoll on the CIA ran that, and I worked with, with her to save that for years and years. Uh, the, a previous administration you know, tried to zero that out and just about did, and it's hanging on by tenterhooks. But that's another mission for John Holdren and your hearty band. We have uh, that one in our sights. You've got that one in your sights. Well, yes, that's sir. great. Uh, and, and that could also be a, a place uh, where that same group could could answer her question. Now, Tammy, since you, did, was that the last question? Yes, sir. Can I, can I make a closing comment? Yes, sir. You want the podium? Part, well, like the podium, uh, yes, I do, uh, if I can. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to I, I wanna thank everybody who's come and also direct my thanks to the many who I'm told are watching uh, on closed circuit and other parts of this complex. And I want to say to those of you who are involved in uh, earth science and studying the earth and the oceans and all of the, in the atmosphere, all of the different fields of science that have been brought together to help us master the mysteries of the uh, challenge that faces us. We have reached a point in human history where with more than seven billion people, two billion more, about the midpoint of this century, and it won't level off until probably 11, they say now, but it, it, that's a success story unfolding in slow motion. But the combination of our rapid increase in numbers and the power of these new technologies and a third element, our way of thinking about our relationship to the Earth, all of that's combined to create an existential crisis for the future of human civilization. And the relationship between science and political decision making is a relationship that is fraught. Whitehead wrote years ago about the two cultures and the divide that separates them. That divide is being narrowed with the build out of the internet and the emergence of a global mind. But how do we come together building on the uh, agreement in Paris and move forward on the basis of the insights that these scientists are collecting? Some are tempted to cynicism and discouragement. This was the 21st conference of the parties. And people think, oh, well, is anything ever going to come of it? Well, there was a great poet in this country in the last century named Wallace Stevens. And he wrote one line that has stayed with me. He said, he wrote, after the last no comes a yes. And on that yes, the future world depends. Every great moral cause that we have faced as a civilization has met with numerous no's. The abolition of slavery, women's suffrage and women's equal rights, the, the ending of apartheid, uh, the reining in of the nuclear arms race, the civil rights movement in our country, and the more recent uh, struggle to achieve equality and justice uh, regardless of sexual orientation. All of those struggles met with ferocious resistance and one no after another, but when it was eventually resolved into a binary choice between what is right and what is wrong, the outcome became inevitable because of who we are, 99% of us. 
And the struggle to save the climate balance and to solve the climate crisis is now yielding to that binary choice, but we are in a race against time. Damage is being done every single day. So I want to close by just asking all of you, as sincerely and in as heartfelt a manner as I can, we need to go to DEF CON 5. We need to put aside many other things and focus on this while there is time. Future generations will ask one of two questions. If they inherit a despoiled and degraded Earth with all of the horrific consequences that you, the scientific community, have warned us would unfold if we do not act more swiftly and more boldly, they would be justified in looking back at us in December of 2015 and asking, what were you thinking? But if we manage to rise to this challenge, as I believe we're beginning to do, I want them to look back and ask of us, how did you find the moral courage to do the right thing? Always remember, please, the will to act is itself a renewable resource. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you.